thank you, Paul. Good morning. For those who don't know me, my name is John Dunn, and I head up the Administrative Data Centre at the CSO. Part of my job is to promote the exploitation and use of administrative data for statistical purposes. Unfortunately, it doesn't always translate easily from the administrative world into the statistical world, and the traditional methods don't always, uh, aren't always easy to use. As such, there's a requirement to source or to develop new methods in order to be able to really use administrative data for statistical purposes. And in a way, that's probably going to be the meat or the theme of my talk today. And probably Pete is going to touch on it later in his, and Eric is going to show you what they've done over the last, number, the last couple of decades. But first, the motivation behind the talk today is um, there are proposals in the European statistical system that will require Ireland, along with other EU member states, to compile census-like small area statistics at detailed geography uh, from reference year 2024 onwards. That might slip out to 25 or 26, but effectively, that's our target, that's our goal. Typically, we'd compile this information every five years using a traditional census model. It's not feasible or cost effective to conduct a traditional census every year. So in that sense, we gotta look to use administrative data. And in fact, the expectation is on EU member states that they will use administrative data in the compilation of these uh, population statistics. Unlike other countries, we don't have a central population population register to use as a starting point. So to fulfill this requirement, we'll either need to put in place a central population register, or given the likelihood that we will put one in place, more likely we'll have to uh, develop and source new methods that we can use to exploit the administrative data to compile those population estimates. So my talk today will talk about some research that we've already done in trying to get to these places and some emerging ideas we have to fill in some of those gaps. The overview of the talk will basically consist of work we've done on the PICADO project, which is population estimates compiled from administrative data only, and then also some work thinking we're doing about uh, geography uh, household composition and how we might put those pieces together. So, to the Picado project itself. And some of you will have seen some presentations on this before, but um, I think this is just really an update on where we're at. So in the absence of a central population register, we need to create a statistical population data set or some type of population spine. The approach we take is one based on signs of life in administration uh, systems. So if somebody has an interaction in one or more public administration systems, they will have a record contained in the statistical population data set. Then, in theory, if counts are taken from this statistical population data set, that will give us an estimate of the population. But in fact, it will give us an underestimate of the population because we won't be able to count people who haven't interacted with those systems that are part of the statistical population data set. So to address this undercount problem, we apply a commonly used method called dual system estimation. There are a number of assumptions underpinning this methodology, which we also attempt to validate. But first, I just want to have a quick look at some of the underlying data sources and their distributions. We use a concept of population trees to present the underlying data distributions, where we have age in the April of reference here on the y-axis and the number of persons or count of persons on the x-axis. Instead of a plus and minus, we count males to the left and females to the right. We plot each of the underlying data sources here. Uh, it looks a little bit like a spaghetti junction, but we will just pick on uh, 
a couple of them. The data sources themselves cover all the life stages from the cradle to the grave. The pink continuous line we see under the black dash line in the age category 0 to 18 represents children for which a child benefit uh, payment has been made. So we get a good count of children there. It's a universal payment. The green continuous line which is post-primary activity in the age category 10 to 18 is based on post-primary enrollments in the school system. And we see we get nearly close to uh, the full administratively active population there. We get quite good coverage in that category just from that source alone. The third line I'd just like to focus on is the, the black dash line, which is on the very outside. And that actually represents the statistical population data set or the combined, all the data sources combined. And so that's our first estimate starting off of the population on a population tree. Now we have to adjust this black dash line or the statistical population data set to get the population distribution, and as I said, we use dual system estimation to do that. So, just quickly, a little bit about dual system estimation. So, we start with our statistical population data set, and in our notation, we'll call this list A, and it's represented by the red rectangle, and it's of size X. We then match it against a suitable second list, we call list B, which is the blue rectangle on the bottom, which is of size N. We then link those two lists and identify the match between them. We call that list AB, and that we call the size of that M. So between those three figures, X the size of list A, N the size of list B, and M, the match between the two of them, gives us an estimate of the population by simply N multiplied by X divided by the match M. So for example, if list B has 20, is of size 20, and the match is of size 16, then we would adjust the size list A, X, which is the size of list A, by 20 over 16, or we'd up, adjust it upwards by 25%. It's like a simple ratio adjustment. However, there are a number of assumptions that must underpin this uh, methodology. That is, each unit, first one is that we call equal catchability. That for list B, it needs to satisfy the criteria that every person in the population has an equal chance or equal probability of being caught in that list. The second one is that there should be no linkage error, and the fact that we have the PPSN, or in our case, we actually use a protected identifier key as part of our privacy mechanisms to link data, which is based on the PPSN. A protected identifier key is effectively an encrypted PPSN, but it preserves linkage, linkage capabilities of the original key across data sources and over time while protecting the privacy of the individual. Again, all data in this project is uh, pseudonymized with and, and uses the protected identifier key. The last assumption that we have for this methodology is there must be no erroneous records or overcount in either list A or list B. We've done something a little bit different to the normal with our list B. Instead of using a survey, which would typically traditionally be used with an equal probability design, we have used another administrative list. We've identified a list that could be a suitable candidate for list B, and we have tested it. That list is a list of all those applying for a driver license or renewing their driver license. And ideally speaking, 
people renew their, or in practice, people typically renew their driver license every 10 years. So there's nearly a rotating cohort through the population. Now, some people won't have a driver license, but we assume that there's no difference between those that do have a driver license and those that don't in terms of their behaviours on the SPD. So what do these population estimates look like uh, when we run the DSE? Okay. This was our first attempt where we looked at 2011. And again, looking at the, the population estimates on using population trees. The SPD is represented by the blue continuous line, as we saw. Uh, so we're bringing that forward. Then applying the DSE methods, we get our population estimates, which are represented by the black continuous line. And then we also include the census counts for 2011 as a point of reference in red. On the female side, the estimates look reasonable enough. There are some differences. We have a slight overcount in the 20 to 40 age, age category and also in the over 65 age category. We're not so good on the male side. We have a little bit more overcount on the over 65 age category, and we also got uh, uh, significantly more differences as well in the 20 to 40 age category. <coughs> so some of these differences, th these differences can be attributed to differences in the population concepts. Remember, Picado uses the signs of life, so if there's an indication that somebody's been active on administrative systems, we count them regardless of whether they've been in for six months or a year or 18 months. Whereas the census is based on usually resident and present on census night. And the census usually resident concept is based on a 12 month period. We may also have some small violations in our underlying assumptions. And also while we've gone, and made every effort to mitigate against erroneous records being present in list A, there may still be erroneous records there. To hunt for erroneous records, we've also developed and extended the DSE methodology into something called trimmed dual system estimation that we can use to hunt for over coverage in list A in parts that we're suspicious of. We have used this new methodology and identified evidence of overcoverage in our list A in the over 65 age category. And when we went back and looked at this system, we saw that we had used a proxy to identify those in receipt of state pension and that, there was in, that, that we didn't use it properly. Uh, this source we then dropped and then recompile the SPD and reproduce our population estimates. So our most recent attempt, and this is now for reference year 2016, looks a bit like this. Again, you'll see on the over 65 age category, you know, we've got very good alignment through this use and development of these new methods. We still may have some erroneous records there, but we have a way to hunt and look for them. We will make these research outputs and the detailed methodology notes available on our website as part of the seminar documentation, and I think the plan to do that is for in a week's time or next Wednesday, and we can contact people about that. This research, I think, is innovative in a number of ways. It's different. The signs of life approach reduces the statistical problems we have to deal with with respect to a statistical population data set from four down to one. The fact that we have our PPSN numbers to link back means that we have no errors around the domain misclassification or linkage error. And then the fact that we use a signs of life approach means that we don't really have to deal, in theory, we don't have to deal with an over coverage problem, although in practice there may be some erroneous records sneaking in. 
We've also derived, derived a methodology such that only one list requires equal catchability. I think uh, in a lot of applications, boat lists are assumed to have uh, uh, equal catchability, or they're supposed to be independent. There are different, slightly different assumptions, so we've derived it slightly differently here. We've also used administrative data as this be in the dual system estimation methodology. Typically, this is done by a coverage survey out in the field, so this will act to reduce costs. We've also looked to validate the underlying assumptions. We assume that we have no linkage error, but the erroneous data, we've extended DSE methods such that allows us a tool to allow us to hunt for those erroneous records. And then to validate the driver license data set, what we did was we swapped it with the QNHS data set, which is based on an equal probability design. Each person has an equal chance of being caught in that survey. And we didn't see any significant differences between the population estimates compiled using that source and the driver license data set. We stick with the driver license data set because it gives us more precision in our results. So we have a system that can form the basis of population estimates at a state level. We now need a mechanism to break these estimates down into suitable geography. In a nutshell, uh, use air code. We need to get air code into the public administration systems. In the absence of air code, we're faced with a huge challenge to try and code address strings uh, geospatially, particularly given the nature of address strings here in Ireland. Once we have air codes on the administrative systems, our thinking is somewhere along the following lines. People may have multiple addresses in the system, or we'll use business rules to choose the geography based on address strings. So we'll prioritize the address strings based on the sources. And then in order to get the right breakdown at geography level, we, will, we can use some application of DSE, again, blocking by geography, age, and gender, and we can constrain the final estimates to state level population estimates. So, turning to household composition and some of our thoughts here. There may be enough, there is quite a bit of auxiliary information available in administrative data sources and we are developing some ideas about how we might use those, that, that information. And I'll try and give a flavor of how we can use that information as we move on here. Again, this is just kind of some emerging thoughts and just the type of thinking that we have to do here. So the data sources we have at our disposal, as Paul mentioned earlier, uh, if we have people with the same air code and administrative systems, that provides some evidence that they may reside, that they reside in the same dwelling, and we can put them together in terms of household composition. There are also other relationships in the administrative data sources. For example, the child benefit systems will allow us to link children to a primary care. So we'll get a, a parent, typically the mother, uh, and child relationships through that data. And for tax purposes also, there's some spousal type or partnership type uh, arrangements available through the tax data. Also, again, that will provide some evidence that there is a link or a relationship between two individuals. There's also the health, uh, the administrative data coming out of health systems, which may provide some information around family formation that we, we would hope to look at. Finally then, as a kind of a ground truth or as truth source, we have our household surveys, or what used to be the QNHS, but now our labor force survey, where we're actually knocking on doors and we can actually uh, see what the uh, household composition is within each of those households that are contacted through our household surveys. Again, I should point out, when we use the air code uh, for statistical analysis purposes, we're not actually using the air code. We're using a protected identifier key based on the air code, again, also to protect privacy. So 
So given these data sources, can we look at and find a method uh, that will get us, allow us to estimate household composition from these data sources? Our early thinking is inspired by some work, again from the Netherlands, the University of Utrecht, where they have extended the concept of DSE methods to consider missing information. We we'll try and lay out a little bit of a framework here in one slide, and uh, it's not easy, but I'm going to give it a go, and if I'm failing, I'm sure Paul and Pat here will give me an elbow to quickly move on. Uh, So the idea is first that in our two lists, in, in the SPD, we classify each person by a, get, by a guess, best guess of what type of household they belong to based on the admin data. So for example, if a person was listed with uh, three children, they might be listed in a, in a household with one adult and three children. So that's the type of household. So the classification is the type of household. So we will call that classification HHA in brackets over there in the far right column. So that's our SPD classified by the household composition and then we get the counts broken down by that uh, classification. So again the household composition classification is of the form one adult, two children, two adults, one child and so on. And we get our marginal total over there in the first row. We do the same for the household survey in terms of each person in the survey, but this instance we know the classification survey, so we know, we know the household composition, so this is really a true, uh, HHB is really the true and what we're trying to estimate for the population as a whole. Okay. We now match the statistical population data set and the survey, and then for that match, up in the top left hand corner, we get a breakdown of the persons that are in both by the type of household they are, they're listed in from the SPD and the type of household they're listed in in the survey. We're doing okay, Pat. <laughs> We also have that other, so far we have that piece B not A with the HHB for those that aren't in the SPD because we know that from the, the survey and we have it for over there HHA from, because we have it from the SPD in the upper right quadrant. So what we do now, we use the relationship in the top left hand cell to estimate down for HHA in the second row where it's missing. Similarly, we use the relationship between HHA and HHB to estimate HHB over in the far right cell. To get. So, that's, so we end up by filling out the, using the top uh, left, uh, the top cell there to fill out down beneath. And again, we use that top cell to fill out to the right to get the HHB classification. You use the distributions to estimate across, okay? Now we've estimated the values for the missing covariates or the counts. These are actually aggregates now at this stage, the counts in those cells. This leaves us with the classic DSE setup where we can block by uh, HHA and HHB to the household composition or the household classifications. So we just carry out the simple uh, DSE for each of, the, each of the blocks or each of the cells or each of the counts in there, and we're able to estimate then for the population. Uh, and we estimate for the population HHA, population HHB. So we get the distribution. It's a joint distribution between what the household composition looks like in the SPD and then for the Q and HS. And then just simply to get the Q, an estimate for the Q and HS, or to get a real estimate of the household composition, we collapse over the one used in the SPD. Because that's our best effort, but what we're really targeting is the household composition as, is, as per the quarterly national household survey. We also have to constrain these estimates also by uh, 
population size and at some stage we're also going to have to estimate the number of occupied housing in the state so there's an additional constraint that we have to bring in here. Okay, so if you got that, I'm fairly impressed. <laughs> so we then have to put the pieces together. Because it took me a good while to get that. So if you got it in three minutes, I'm seriously impressed. Uh, so what we're left in, so now we have our geography and we have our household composition. Geography will also inform our household composition. Now we have to figure out some way to break out that distribution to get the household composition by geography. Once we have this, we have our distributions now, we have our counts for the actual population and we can start building out the statistical population data set to get an enhanced population data set for the population in total. So we'll have one record per person in the population with their geographic details and what type of household they have, what type of household they're in. So, in the, so we start with the, the grey part where we're confident of geography and household. Then for the remainder of the SPD, which is the purple part around, where we have person records, but we're unsure of the geography and household identifiers, we need to bring that in and bring, bring that in. And then finally, for those persons that are not on the SPD, we need to try and bring in and identify, um, uh, we, need, we need to assign households and geography to them, what type of household they're from and what geography they're coming from. That then becomes the basis of our statistical population data set for the whole population from which we build out attributes from based on the different administrative data sets. This type of approach has a number of advantages over just typically just going for it. We have a methodological framework to underpin our estimates at all stages. So we, we're following proper codes of practice and we're looking for sound methodology to underpin what we're doing. This approach also facilitates quality indicators and diagnostic information with respect to the estimates. So as the quality of our statistical population data set, our administrative data improves over time, we can actually see the benefits and how it's impacting the quality of our statistical estimates going forward. We actually know how good we're doing with some kind of framework like that as well, even at a point in time. So, that's really, I think, uh, me moving on now to what, what to, to concluding part of the talk. So really, to really to meet the requirement and push on towards a virtual census, we need to enhance the quality of the data that we have, both in terms of coverage but more importantly in the use of uh, air codes across the system. And that's something that's a really strong message that we're pushing out from, from ourselves. And it's not just important for statistical purposes, it's really important for effective and efficient uh, public administration. Statistics is the downstream beneficiary. We also need to ensure that whatever we do, we have sound methodological underpinnings behind what we're doing so that we're able to defend what we're doing in a robust manner. And part of that methodological process requires us, we will need to bring surveys into that methodological framework and use that in an efficient and effective way. The surveys actually give us the ground truth on the ground, allows us to go from the administrative to the statistical concepts or validate the administrative, what we're doing with respect going from administrative data type concepts to statistical uh, variables or statistical concepts. In, term, in terms of the NDI, we need to keep pushing and ensuring that it continues to mature. And with respect to the CSO, we really need to continue investing in developing and deploying new methods and how to exploit, fully exploit this administrative data to get value for money. 
And to do this, we, are collaborate, we, we need to collaborate with the right people in NSIs, the likes of Eric and Pete, and in academia, identify the right people in academia that may have solutions which we can borrow. We won't say steal, but we can uh, take inspiration from and deploy with our own administrative data. And hopefully going along this track, and then for reference year 2024, and we keep pushing on, we may be able to make a virtual census in Ireland a reality at some stage. Thank you.